Well, I must uh, thank uh, Peter for this very kind introduction and, and Scott too. I, I, uh, my wife won't be able to live with me when I get home and I tell her <laughs> what a great man I am. Uh, <laughs> but I'm here uh, at the invitation and I'm so grateful for it of the Institute of Public Affairs it's the voice of freedom. You know, freedom isn't free. And every generation has to struggle to maintain freedom. And I know those in you, of you in this room understand that. And I urge you, don't give up. If you don't lose faith, you'll keep it. And keep it for your children and your grandchildren that we all have to do that. So I'm going to talk to today about CO2, the gas of life. Uh, you know, you, would, you hear about carbon pollution. Of course, they're talking about CO2. You know, I'm standing here breathing out CO2. Each of you is breathing out CO2. We'll measure it in the room. At the end of this, I have a, a meter here. I won't, I won't turn it on yet. <laughs> but uh, we'll have a little raffle and see who can guess what it, the number is in the room. It's 400 parts per million outside, maybe 420, you know. I, uh, I measured 430 when we, just before we came over here at, uh, near the river. Uh, but each of us breathes out two pounds of CO2 a day. That's a lot of CO2, and there are eight billion people in the world multiplied by two pounds in the 365 days a year. So the CO2 budget, uh, to some degree, is due to the population of people. And some of the more extreme uh, defenders of the planet say the, the fundamental problem is, in, is not CO2, it, it's people. You know, the planet can't sustain more than one billion people. And so I look around, and that means seven out of eight of us here have to leave the planet, you know, to save the planet. And, you know, this is really uh, not good stuff. You know, we, we shouldn't put up with this. It's, it's nonsense. But let's, let's uh, go. So this is a crusade. This is not science we're talking about. This is a religious crusade. And crusades have a way of ending badly. <laughs> this was one of the first, you know, when uh, Europe went to save the True Cross, or uh, that was the cover story. It was actually to make lots of money and, uh, or to jockey for power back home. So we're, there were many reasons, but the last reason was saving the True Cross. But they had slogans, uh, Deus Bult, you know, God wants it. And so apparently today, God wants us to get rid of all CO2. Let's hope we don't do that because that would be the end of life on Earth. Of course, none of us here are in favor of pollution. You know, I'm not in favor of pollution. This is pollution in Shanghai. You can just barely see the bottle opener building there, the Pearl Tower, and a poor citizen of Shanghai with his mask on. This is not because of COVID, it's because of pollution, real pollution. But, it, you know, CO2, you can't see the room is full of CO2. It's full of water vapor. Both of them are greenhouse gases, and I can see you clearly and vice versa, I, I think. And so, uh, nevertheless, when you read the popular media, they show you this picture, and you're supposed to assume that you're looking at CO2. So it's just another example of the dishonesty of this campaign of lies. This is uh, supposedly the future. The, the, uh, this is my wife, Barbara, who wanted to come on this trip, but had some health problems, unfortunately. But she's standing near my home in Princeton, where uh, this was once a green meadow, and it, they just started to put in solar panels. I, so, sometimes they call them solar farms. I, I think a better name might be a solar plantation, you know, it, with the connotation of slavery that goes with it. And uh, anyway, since, since this time, the entire area is covered with these black, miserable panels, and so, is that really the sort of world that we want to live in? And of course, these stupid things don't produce any electricity at night. And uh, so it's, it's purely virtue signaling. It has no economic reason. It has no scientific reason. 
If you haven't read this book, I strongly recommend it. It's called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and a Madness and, and the Madness of Crowds. It was first published in 1841, I think, by uh, Charles Mackey. And uh, it enumerates all of the crazy things that the human race has done for many, many centuries. And we're right in the midst of a new one now. This is the extraordinary popular delusion and the madness of crowds related to climate. You know, saving the, saving the planet, you know, net zero, all of the buzzwords, which mean nothing. So here is uh, the introduction to that book. Uh, I, I like to remind people that it, Bernard Baruch, the great American financier at the time of the Depression who made a bundle of money by predicting it correctly, insisted that anyone who worked with him had to read this book and uh, take an examination, which he personally gave, you know, to make sure that he, they understood the lessons of the book, which was avoid groupthink at all costs. <laughs> so here's what he says, in reading the history of nations, we find that like individuals, they have their whims and their peculiarities, their seasons of excitement and recklessness when they care not what they do. We find that whole communities suddenly fix their minds upon one object, net zero, and go mad in that pursuit that millions of people become simultaneously impressed with one delusion and run after it till their attention is caught by some new folly more captivating than the first. So uh, Mackey would have completely understood what's going on now. It's, it's happened before. Alas, it will probably happen again. Now, uh, Scott mentioned that I'm actually not a climate scientist. I, I would consider it an insult to be called a climate scientist the way climate science has gone. But I do know a lot about climate. I uh, was the author of one of the very first books on climate uh, as a member of Jason. Uh, my name is in the list of authors there. And this was 1982. It was really before things were getting hot, but it was already being talked about within government circles of the United States. And uh, so we studied what CO2 might do if we increased the concentrations. And sure enough, we came to the conclusion it would cause some warming. The first number we got was too small, so. We, we increased it just arbitrarily until it was big enough that it would seem like an okay thing to put in the book that our sponsors would like. So we guessed three degrees warming from doubling CO2, and I can assure you that wasn't science. That was just what do we think the sponsors want? I mean, it's, it's, I'm actually quite ashamed of it, but uh, anyway, it shows that I've been in this field a long time, <laughs> longer than most climate scientists. Uh, Peter was kind enough to mention one of the reasons I didn't pay very much attention to this book was I was working on something I thought was more important. I never thought CO2 was very important, but I thought this was. This was the early days of uh, the Strategic Defense Initiative in the United States, and President Reagan, to his credit, said, I don't want to uh, respond to a Soviet attack on the United States by annihilating Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, I want to defend us. And uh, at the time, there was this mutual assured destruction doctrine, you know, if we're attacked, we will simply wipe out. So it will all be wiped out together and everybody will feel good about it. Re Reagan, Reagan really didn't like that very much and he, he was not about to do that. And so he challenged uh, the engineering and scientific community to figure out ways to stop incoming missiles so we didn't have to annihilate Moscow. And uh, one of the things we talked about was high power laser defenses. So if you have, you can easily build a laser on the ground that has a megawatt of power 
and a megawatt of power focused onto an incoming missile will destroy it. No problem. The, the, the problem is that you've got to get that power through the atmosphere above us, you know, to the missile. And as the laser propagates through the atmosphere, very much uh, what Peter described, the twinkling of star phenomenon happens to the laser. And so by the time it reaches the intended target, it's broken up into hundreds of little sub-beams. So instead of attacking the target with a megawatt of power, you're attack attacking it with one hundredth of a megawatt, which isn't enough to hurt it. And um, so this was a problem well known to astronomers. It happens because even in a completely clear sky, the air overhead has little patches of warm and cool air. And so as the uh, radiation from the laser goes through the air, it gets wrinkled. It goes a little faster with the warm air, a little slower with the cool air. And it won't focus properly. It breaks up into speckles. So astronomers knew that they had the same problem. If you look at a distant galaxy or star in, on the photographic plate, instead of getting a nice point image of the star, you get a hundred speckles. And you can't tell, is the speckle another star or is it, is it a nearby star? So astronomers knew you could correct this. If you had enough light coming in from a star, you could actually measure how much the wavefront was distorted. And then you bounce the incoming starlight off of a mirror that has been distorted in the opposite direction. And so the messed up wave hits the mirror, bounces off what they call a rubber mirror, which has been carefully distorted. And when it comes out, it's perfect. And then you can focus it. So this is called adaptive optics. And to make it work, you have to be able to measure the state of the atmosphere in the direction that you're looking. And so there are only about five stars in the sky that are bright enough to do that. So it, it was considered a, you know, interesting but not very practical by the astronomy community. And it certainly wasn't practical for defense because you can't count on the Russians attacking from the direction of the brightest star in the sky. <laughs> so, um, so we discussed this and I said, well, you know, I know how to solve this because uh, we can make artificial stars in any direction, including the direction that we're being attacked by, because there is a layer of sodium atoms at 100 kilometers overhead over Australia, over America, over Russia. And by shining a laser that is scattered by the sodium atoms, you can make an artificial star that is plenty bright enough to do the adaptive optics correction I mentioned and to set the rubber mirror so it is perfect. And to their credit, the Air Force uh, officers who were there, after expressing quite a bit of disbelief, went back and did due diligence, couldn't find anything wrong with this idea, and uh, actually spent several million dollars buying a laser that would illuminate the sodium and, and building a secret observatory. You can see the that, that it's not secret anymore, but it was secret for 10 years in, in the desert of New Mexico. And so I, I was quite nervous at this time that maybe it won't work. <laughs> but fortunately, when they turned it on, it worked the first time. And so I got a lot of credit in the U.S. government for doing that. It was very secret for, you know, 10 years. But that's the reason I was often called to Washington to help out with some technical problem, one or another, because I had solved this problem that was considered important at that time. And since then, you know, Soviet Union has dissolved. We, we're not all that worried about missile attacks. And this has been declassified. So if you go to any big telescope today, you will, at night, you will usually see one of these yellow beams going up to the sky to just to improve the astronomical imaging. So uh, now I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about hard science. And so I, I apologize to anyone who uh, <laughs> doesn't like hard science very much, and I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. <laughs> So the, the first thing you have to remember when they talk about global warming, the Earth doesn't have a single temperature. 
you know, the temperature varies all over the place. It's different temperature in this room than it was outside where we were having our drinks and or out in the open air on the street. And in particular, if you go up through the atmosphere, the temperature drops very, very rapidly. And uh, here's an example in Australia, uh, near Mount Kachusko is Hotel Kachusko, where they've got temperature records, and I got a copy of those before I came to Australia, and I compared them to Melbourne, and average over a year, Hotel Kachusko at one and a half kilometers altitude is 10 degrees colder than Melbourne sitting at sea level. So that means uh, the temperature drops, it turns out it's linear uh, at 10 degrees and every one and a half kilometers, 6.6 .6 centigrade per kilometer. That's actually a very good number, you know, for moist air. If you go all around the world, it doesn't matter where you are, you find that the temperature drops at that rate. And so that's this lower red line here. So horizontal scale is temperature. Temperature is getting colder to the left, hotter to the right. As you go from the surface up, it gets colder and colder until you reach typically 11, 12, 13 kilometers where it stops getting colder. And then there's a long uh, interval where it's almost the same temperature and then it warms up again because of the solar ultraviolet heating ozone, the thing that I battled with Mr. Gore about. So I knew, I knew a lot more about ozone than he did. Uh, now here is uh, the most important uh, view graph of the evening. And uh, if you go away with nothing else, I want you to go away with this message. And I, so I'm going to take some time to explain what the message is. So what I'm showing here is the radiation that goes to space. So the vertical axis is the power of thermal radiation, the radiation we met, emit, you know, that is at very long wavelengths. And they typically measure uh, radiation at, at these wavelengths in, in terms of spatial frequency. So the number of waves per centimeter, 500 waves per centimeter, 1,000 waves per centimeter, et cetera. And uh, so frequency of the radiation is left and right, and power is going up. And the total power that goes out into space is the area under these curves. Now there are actually a number of curves. There's a smooth blue curve, and that is a fabulous curve for physicists is due to Max Planck, who's the gentleman in the top right here. Max Planck uh, figured out the formula for this curve. It was considered very, very mysterious for many years, but it was known what its shape was just from experiment. So he, he figured out a formula that fits us perfectly, you know, to fractions of a percent. And that was the beginning of quantum mechanics. That was the year 1900. So if the Earth had no greenhouse gases, the amount of radiation that would come out would be the area under that blue plunk curve. But in fact, what goes out is quite a bit less, and it's the area under the jagged uh, black curve, and that's due to Carl Schwarzschild, who was a bit younger than Planck, but he figured out how it is that carbon dioxide, water vapor, ozone, affect the radiation that the Earth emits to space. And so the black curve is what we call the Schwarzschild curve. Now you notice that there are lots of wiggles in, and, and the area under the black curve, if you work it out, it's only about 70% of the area under the blue curve. So greenhouse gases in total are reducing our cooling radiation by about 70% or 30%, I guess, reduction. But the radiation going to space is 70% of what it would be if there were, if there were no greenhouse gases. So it's, it, and, and you can see there's a big gap there labeled CO2 like a missing tooth. And uh, it's a fairly big effect. And um, so CO2 is certainly hindering the cooling of the Earth. It really is a greenhouse gas. It really does warm the Earth. And we should be grateful without CO2 the Earth, most of the Earth would be too cold to live on. But the, the important message here is, is the fact that there are, is also a red curve. The red curve shows what happens if you double CO2. 
So there's a black jagged curve. Underneath it is a red curve, and they're almost the same. That's the message. That's the message you have to remember. It almost doesn't matter if you double CO2. It almost doesn't affect the radiation to space. So if you put in numbers, doubling CO2 only reduces radiation to space by 1%, 1%. 100% increase of CO2, 1% effect on radiation to space. So of course the mainstream media would never tell you that, but I, the UN knows perfectly well this is true. They get the same numbers as we do. They never will show you this curve, or they will never admit that it's only 1%, but it's, it's a 1% effect. Now you might ask, you know, how do you know that we're doing this right? And so this is just a comparison of the codes. That was a model used to, but the model is almost the same as what's measured. So on the right are three spectra of radiation coming from Earth out into outer space measured by satellites back around, around 1970. And uh, the top one is at the Sahara, the middle is the Mediterranean, the bottom is uh, over the South Pole, closer to Australia. And the left is uh, the calculations of that code I showed you before. You can't really tell the difference. So this is one of the few things in climate that if you calculate it, you get exactly what is observed. There is no uncertainty to this. And the UN knows this too. They know perfectly well that you can't make a mistake on this. If, if you're careful about doing it. So uh, that, it is really true that doubling CO2 only makes a 1% change. And, and this is the final hard physics slide, and uh, I'll, I'll quickly get off of this. But the, a 1% change is, is like changing the emissivity of the Earth by 1%. So it turns out that here are two other interesting guys that you should know about. One of them is. Uh, Josef Stefan, he, he's the only Slovenian physicist I ever heard of, but he was a great one. And he was the one who discovered this uh, F equals epsilon sigma t to the fourth, that first equation there. So it's called the Stefan Boltzmann equation because he made another important discovery. He discovered this graduate student, Boltzmann. <laughs> And he said to Boltzmann, I have measured how radiation goes into space, and it goes as the fourth power of the temperature. That's a huge effect, you know, because that means if you double the temperature, you increase radiation by two to the fourth by 16, you know. So it's an amazing factor. But Boltzmann couldn't figure out why would it be the fourth power. And so he assigned this poor student, who turned out to be not such a poor student, uh, the job of fun, where, where does the factor of four come from? And he solved the problem. It turned out, for those of you who have a science background, it, it came from simple electromagnetic theory, which had just been developed by Maxwell, and from thermodynamics. So it's, it's something where you can derive that, if you're Boltzmann, in four or five lines. It's, a, it's an amazing feat. But you can't get the coefficients in front of it, but you get the fourth power. And the, the result of that is that a 1% change in radiation to space is a quarter percent, that same factor of four, but it goes in the denominator, a quarter percent change in temperature, absolute temperature. And so you can do the calculation for warming in your head because the absolute temperature of the Earth's surface is about 300 Kelvin. A quarter percent of 300 Kelvin is, or if I put in the right number, it's about 0.75, it's actually 0.71 if I put in all the Correct value. So the, the direct warming from CO2 is less than one degree, 0.7 degrees, very small. And uh, this is a problem if you're a climate scientist because nobody cares if it's 0.7 degrees. You can't feel 0.7 degrees. The air conditioner doesn't trip on and off if you have 0.7 degrees. So um, what to do? Uh, well. You invoke huge positive feedbacks in all of these UN climate models. So uh, instead of acting like a, a normal system, somehow just the 0.7 degrees gets multiplied by factors of three or four or five, <laughs> even 10 in some cases, that uh, you, it's almost impossible to justify this idea of a positive feedback. But you need it, otherwise CO2 is too wimpy to be worried about. So you, 
So they've got this problem that the first step, how much does CO2 affect radiation to space, it almost doesn't affect it. So you need something in the second step to change this radiation to space into a temperature that's scary, and that's the positive feedback here. So I, I like to joke it's a little bit like affirmative action for CO2 if we have uh, poor students coming to our university. Uh, we, we often let them in anyway, even though they're not fully prepared, uh, is affirmative action. And so uh, CO2 is a little bit like a poor uh, would-be university student. Um, the problem with positive feedback is this guy here. This is uh, a French chemist, Le Chatelier. And Le Chatelier noted that in most natural processes in nature, feedbacks are negative. You know, positive feedbacks almost never occur. And yet we're assuming there's a positive feedback. If we don't assume a positive feedback, we don't get money for our laboratory next year because nobody's worried. And so uh, this is a real uh, problem. So let me, uh, let me summarize uh, for, for those of you who don't, uh, uh, are maybe not so familiar with the, the, the simple physics there. The CO2 currently in the Earth's atmosphere is uh, very much like a coat of paint on the surface of the Earth. It makes the Earth look a particular color in the infrared where thermal radiation goes up. And if you paint a barn red, you've got a nice red barn, you might think, well, it's not red enough, I will put on another coat of paint and it will get redder. But no, if you put another coat of the same paint on, the barn will look just as red it, it was before because a good quality paint, one layer of paint is enough to saturate it and uh, it doesn't help to put more paint on it. And that's the situation we have now with CO2. The amount of CO2 we have is like that first coat of red paint. It's had a big effect and I, I, I showed you that. Uh, let's see if I can get this to go back. Uh, I showed you that the, the first coat of CO2 is that black jagged line where it says CO2. The green line is no CO2. So going from no CO2 to the green line is a big step. And that's the first coat of red paint. Going from the black jagged line to the red jagged line is the second coat of red paint. You can hardly see the difference. Okay, no, no. all right, so uh, now I want to, uh, switch to another thing. I've just told you that CO2 almost doesn't matter for climate. It's a, it's a nothing, it's a phony uh, emergency. But it is enormously beneficial to the planet and to life on the planet because it's extremely uh, beneficial to the growth of plants. This is a field of, uh, who knows? Okay, so it's a field of soybeans, and it's, uh, it's genetically modified. How, how do I know it's genetically modified? <laughs> Doesn't have any weeds. So he, he's planted, you know, a variety of soybeans that you can spray herbicide on it, and it's, it's immune to the herbicide, but all the weeds are killed. So that's why there are no weeds. <laughs> it's a Roundup Ready. And uh, furthermore, this is a very lush field of soybeans, and one of the reasons it looks so lush is because there's more CO2 now than there was 50 years ago. So all over the world, if you measure crop yields and, and you try to take out other confounding factors like different seeds or applications of fertilizer or rainfall, it doesn't matter what crop you look at, they're all growing better now, and it's almost certainly due to more CO2, so it's a big effect. It's, it's not a tiny effect. Here, here for example, is a laboratory experiment with a, a common weed we have on the east coast of the United States, and at the extreme left is sort of the starvation level uh, close to the last glacial maximum, 150 parts per million. As you increase CO2 from left to right, you can see the weed is growing faster and faster. And uh, that's true of crops, it's true of forest trees, it's true of all photosynthetic 
organisms which we rely on for our life. That's We don't photosynthesize. We have to eat plants that do, or, or we have to eat animals that eat plants that do. So all plants do much better with more CO2. Now, two main reasons I, I want you to remember. Uh, the reason plants do better with more CO2 is, one, they don't need as much water. And if any of you here have a gardener or a farmer, you know that drought, you always have droughts, you know. Some years better than others, but they're, that's a problem. And so if you have more CO2, plants uh, get by with less water. If you double CO2, roughly speaking, a plant only needs half as much water. So it's a big effect. And, and the reason for that is the plant has to let CO2 molecules diffuse uh, through its leaf. Maybe I have a picture. Yeah, here's a picture. So here's an elm tree leaf, and uh, it's got a hole in the surface of the leaf, the epidermis, and the hole is to let CO2 diffuse in. That's the only reason it's there. And the CO2 then is captured by the enzymes of the plant and combined with water, and energy is used from the sun to make sugar. And uh, there's a, this is most, this is all forest trees uh, use this uh, picture I've shown here. There are a, a small number of plants, uh, some of them grown here in Australia, in particular sugarcane uh, and American corn, maize, which use a slightly more complicated uh, way of handling the CO2, which is adapted to the low levels of CO2 we have today. To, you know, these are famine levels of CO2 as far as plants are concerned. So uh, that, that has given uh, an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary advantage to sugarcane, corn, and uh, a number of weeds, too. Um, so, so the first, the first advantage I, I, I uh, probably didn't finish explaining was that Plants are not stupid. If they notice that there's more CO2 in the air, they simply grow fewer holes in the leaf. So if you look at a leaf on a plant today, an elm tree today, and you compare it to a museum specimen that was put there in 1850, which you can do, you notice that today elm trees have a lot fewer holes in them. So they don't need as much water today as they did 150 years ago. And you can do that quantitatively, so there's just no question that all plants are growing leaves which are less leaky to water. So that's the water advantage that they get from more CO2. The second advantage is a little more subtle. This is what's called photorespiration, and this is the reason that uh, even though you can grow plants in greenhouses and not worry about the water, there's no problem provided water in a greenhouse. You don't, it doesn't all evaporate. You've got you know, glass to keep it in. Plants still grow much better with more CO2 in a greenhouse, and that's because more CO2 suppresses photorespiration. And this is kind of an interesting story that goes back to the origin of uh, carbon fixation in life. Three and a half billion years, maybe a long, long time ago, was this enzyme called uh, Rubisco, it's short for ribulose 1,5-biphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. This was invented, and it had a design flaw in it, which didn't matter when it was invented because there was no oxygen in the air. But, you know, as a result of plants flourishing uh, with photosynthesis, more and more oxygen has come into the air, and so oxygen turns out to poison this enzyme. So all plants have to, except for sugarcane and corn, the C4 plants, all other plants, and that's most plants, have to detoxify uh, the results of occasionally making a mistake and then grabbing an oxygen instead of a CO2 in, in the interior biochemistry of the leaf. And that results in nasty products that the plant doesn't like, you know, hydrogen peroxide, for example, or ammonia. So plants are full of various uh, detoxification schemes to handle this mistake that goes back so many billions of years. And it's a big deal. It's about, it costs about 25% of the potential productivity of the plant today at the levels of CO2 that we have. 
And so that, that's why greenhouses work so well. It's not because of the water efficiency, it's because of suppressing photorespiration. And here you can see a picture of the greening of the Earth uh, taken by satellites. And this is over the period from 1982 to 2010. And the first thing you notice is most of the greening is in arid regions of the Earth. Western Australia has greened a huge amount. You know, the Kalahari Desert in South, you know, Africa, not Namibia has greened enormously, the Sahel. Western United States and Canada. And this is this uh, benefit of drought resistance that we've been talking about. Plants now have less holes and they don't need as much water, so they don't need as much water to grow. So big, very important benefit we were getting from more CO2. By the way, the, the Donahue was, a, I, I've never met him, but he was an Australian. He was the first one to point this out. and. Uh, the, the guy who published that picture. All right, so I'm almost finished, and uh, now I'm going to switch to uh, areas that I'm not any more expert than anyone here. You know, maybe I know more about radiation transfer, but I really have been studying human nature all my life, and I still don't understand it. I don't understand why this is happening. But here are some possible reasons uh, that we have this frenzy about net zero and saving the planet, all of which is not true. There is no need to, nothing needs saving. So the, uh, uh, there are noble lies, which I'll mention briefly, political lies, there's ignorance, there's stupidity, and the good old universal vice of greed. Uh, so first of all, a noble lie you can read about in Plato's Republic. It's, it's uh, one of the more obscure parts, but here's the definition, I think, from Wikipedia. It says, in politics, a noble lie is a myth or untruth, often but not invariably, of a religious nature, knowingly propagated by an elite to maintain social harmony or to advance an agenda. The noble lie is a concept originated by Plato, as described in the Republic. And so part of this movement certainly was a noble lie. You, some of you are old enough will remember the Club of Rome that was looking around for some great cause to unite humanity that we could fight against. And so CO2 was ideal, you know. So instead of fighting with the Russians or the Chinese, we'll, fight, we'll all fight together against CO2. And that is a noble cause, you know. You have to admit it's a noble but it, it, it actually doesn't work, you know. And it, it's got the problem that it's a lie, you know, and once you've told one lie, the next lie won't be so noble. Yeah. Then there are political lies, and this is one of my favorite Americans. This is H.L. Lincoln, and he says, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. And certainly the uh, threat of climate catastrophe is completely imaginary. There's nothing to it. And the sad thing about this is this works most effectively on our children. You know, young kids, you know, have not become cynical about the human race. And so they believe all this crap. And uh, many of them take it much too seriously. You know, they, uh, and it's, a, it's really a crime. We shouldn't do that. Uh, then there's ignorance. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ignorance in the world. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples. This is Jan Hus, who was burnt at the stake in 1415 by pointing out that the church in Czechoslovakia at that time was profoundly corrupt. You know, people were on the take. And uh, so they burned him at the stake, and the day they picked to burn him was a wet day. It was drizzling in rain, so the, the fire wouldn't start. And so the, um, a very pious old lady here comes up to, to try and help God with a bunch of dry brush, which he dumps at his feet, and then it catches fire and burns him. And as he's burning, he, his words were sanctus 
sancta simplicitas, ho holy innocence. And so many of the people that are pushing alarmism today really are ignorant. You can't blame them because all they've ever heard since childhood is this brainwashing that you're, we've got carbon pollution, the earth is going to burn up. Uh, here's a somewhat more surprising uh, take on this, and it's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was one of the very few German clergymen who stood up to Hitler. You know, most of the other clergymen either kept quiet or they ran away to the United States or the United Kingdom. Uh, but Bonhoeffer stayed in Germany and he did his best to stop the Nazis. And he's had plenty of time to think about what had happened to this country of Germany, the country of poets and of musicians and philosophers and scientists. How is it possible that this most cultured country in Europe, really, uh, was taken over by these thugs? And uh, he eventually decided that the main problem was stupidity. And so this is his words against stupidity. We can have no defense. Neither protest nor force can touch it. Reasoning is of no use. Facts that contradict personal prejudices can simply be disbelieved. Indeed, the fool can counter by criticizing them. And if they're undeniable, they can just be pushed aside as trivial exception. So the fool, as distinct from the scoundrel, is completely self-satisfied. In fact, they can easily become dangerous, as it does not take much to make them aggressive. Yeah, I get regular death threats, you know, from fools, right? I, I don't take them all that seriously, but I, it does worry me. For that reason, greater caution is called for than with a malicious one. So uh, here's an example. This is an old problem. This is which Galileo faced. You know, Galileo was put on trial for a heresy because of his uh, claim that the sun was the center of the solar system. The planets went around the sun, and this uh, was said to contradict the Bible. I don't think it did. I don't ever remember reading in the Bible about what the center of the solar system was. But nevertheless, that was the take. And so. This is a letter from Galileo, who was in prison, to Kepler, who was the one who discovered that planets move uh, around the sun in elliptic orbits, uh, both of them great men. My dear Kepler, I wish that we might laugh at the stupidity of the human herd. What do you have to say about the principal philosophers of this academy who are filled with the stubbornness of an asp and who do not want to look at either the planets the moon or the telescope, even though I freely and deliberately offered them the opportunity a thousand times, truly, just as the ass stops its ears, so do these philosophers shut their eyes to the light of truth. And you see that all the time with climate. You know, the climate people will not debate. They will not stand up to uh, competent critics. Uh, so it, it very much the same situation Galileo faced. The cardinals who were putting him on trial, it's lucky he escaped with his life, uh, refused to look through the telescope to see the moons of Jupiter or the mountains on the, on the moon, our own moon. Then there's greed. <laughs> this is one of my favorite uh, quotes from Alexander Pushkin. Pushkin, you know, was the closest thing the Russians ever had to Shakespeare. He was a fabulous uh, writer, poet. Uh, uh, he, and he himself was a big fan of Shakespeare. I, I don't know whether he thought of himself as a Russian Shakespeare, but uh, <laughs> this says in Russian, if, if there should happen to be a trough, there will be pigs. And, uh, and that's certainly true. That's a big problem in my own community of academia. Money has poured into academia if you're willing to support the narrative that, you know, there is a climate emergency. You know, I, it's disappointing. When I was younger, I thought that uh, we would set a higher price to be bought, but apparently not. <laughs> 
So I want to end here with one more quote from uh, Bonhoeffer, alas, was hanged uh, just before the Americans could rescue him. Uh, but this, there's no question this is going to be the finale of net zero, whether it's in Australia or America or Europe or the United Kingdom, it will be a wreck. You know, people will lose their jobs, electricity will stop flowing. And so Bonhoeffer says here, if I see a madman driving a car into a group of innocent bystanders, then I can't wait for the catastrophe and then comfort the wounded and bury the dead. I must try to wrestle the steering wheel out of the hands of the driver. Now, that's something every one of us here should be trying to do. You know, you don't have to be a scientist to do that. Everyone should be trying to do that. Let it, let's get the steering wheel out of the hands of these madmen before we have this wreck here. So I will, I will stop here. So thank you very much. If you can wait a minute, Scott, sure, this takes sure. 30 seconds to warm up. But who, who would like to guess the uh, CO2 concentration in the room? You know. uh, Six, 600? 700. 700, okay. Any, any other? A thousand? Yeah, okay. The, uh, it's, it's, it, it'll tell us the true answer here in 15 seconds. <laughs> how, how much? Eight, 800. 600, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. We've, we've had enough guesses now. Two, one, 825. Pretty good. <laughs>